As we saw in the previous episode on Niklas Luhmann, for him, the mass media are a social system that provides society with a background reality. The media let us know what is known to be known. But what is known to be known changes all the time, and it can be debated and disputed. It's not simply taken for granted. The dynamic and debatable background reality is real. Not despite, but because it's constructed by the media. Luhmann says, the reality of a system is always a correlate of its own operations. It's always its own construction. How the mass media construct reality, that which is known to be known, differs from other constructions of reality, for instance, in science. Other than media information, scientific theories, for instance, are typically communicated in a way that only a few trained specialists can understand and respond to them. Read a book by Luhmann and you know what I mean. Most scientific truths are not known to be known. On the one hand, each social system is very specific and can only communicate in its particular way. But on the other hand, in its particular way, a system can communicate basically anything. Science, for instance, can formulate an academic theory of the mass media. That's what Luhmann did. Vice versa, the media can at least try to make an academic theory known to be known, even though it's been expressed in quite esoteric language. That's what I'm trying to do in this video. Anything can become a topic in the media, including Luhmann's media theory. Topics are presented in the media in different formats. Luhmann calls them program sectors, Programbereiche. First, news and reports, second, advertising, and third, entertainment. This video reports on Luhmann's theory. Some websites advertise the book The Reality of the Mass Media. There may even be an entertaining movie about Luhmann in the future, but I doubt it. In any case, Luhmann says the triad of news reports, advertising, and entertainment is the most important internal structure of the mass media system. News, our program sector, obviously concerned with spreading information. However, news do so quite paradoxically. Luhmann quips in his peculiar, laconic, ironic way, in the news sector, the mass media spread ignorance in the form of facts that need to be constantly renewed so that no one notices. News spread ignorance in two ways. First, they report on events as they unfold. The view is much too close to be comprehensive. Second, news can only report a highly selected number of facts. You can be sure that whatever you hear about in the news, you know only superficially, as long as you exclusively rely on news for your information about it. There's always much more going on than what the news have time to inform you about. But, since there are always more and newer news, you have no time to reflect on their limitations. It seems that the news are telling you more and more, but in fact, they keep you in a state of perpetual ignorance. As mentioned in the first episode on Luma, He's especially interested in how modern function systems emerged between the 16th and 18th century. This is also the case with news. News, as we know them, Luhmann suggests, are quite new and an unlikely historical occurrence. They are unlikely because the idea of news is that they should be surprising, novel and special. But what's surprising, novel and special is normally assumed to happen only rarely. Only in modernity, Luhmann suggests, news created the unlikely phenomenon that tons of events considered to be newsworthy happen all the time. Given this unlikelihood, Luhmann says, it was quite daring to start a newspaper business in early modernity based on the expectation that next week, too, there will be a sufficient supply of information that can be printed. To begin with, news wasn't just a daring, but also a highly suspicious business. In the early 1600s, Luhmann says, the poet Ben Jonson concluded that the serial production of news 
practically proved they were a fraud. Traditional record keeping, like historical annals, found it wise to wait until events were concluded before noting them down. Something had to have already happened to be remembered. But modern news take the unlikely approach to report events that are open-ended, like, let's say, climate change. Along with the unlikely invention of perpetually developing news emerged a new writing style and a new profession, journalism. News had to be written in a peculiar tense. Journalism suggests at the same time that something already happened but also that it happens just now and that it's going to happen in the future. Again, think of climate change. It's a perfect topic for journalism because it bridges past, present and future. The topic of climate change brings us to the contested issue of truth in the news. Yes, news and reports are taken to be and present themselves as information on facts. We rightly expect them not to lie. Luhmann says the assumption of truth is indispensable. Fake news can be and are singled out as corrupt news in and by the media themselves. And yet, while news and reporting can only work with the assumption of truth, Luhmann says the mass media are only interested in truth under very limited conditions, which are completely different from academic research. Truth in the news can never be the whole truth. Luhmann illustrates this with two examples from literature. Borges' story on exactitude in science and Lawrence Stern's novel Tristram Shandy. Borges' story is about the absurdity of a map that represents a territory one to one. It would cover the whole territory and thus be useless. Similarly absurd is Tristram Shandy. The novel is supposed to give a complete account of the protagonist's life in nine volumes. By trying to mention all facts of the protagonist's life, the story becomes so convoluted that he's not even born yet at the end of volume two. Similarly, Luhmann says, point-to-point -point correspondence between media information and facts can never be achieved. Since the news can never report all the facts they need to select, they generate information, Luhmann says, with specific selectors. These differ greatly, for instance, from scientific theories and methods that academics use to produce truth. Without claiming the list to be complete, Luhmann discusses 10 selectors used to produce information in news and reports. First, surprise and novelty. This includes both irregular surprises like earthquakes and regular novelties like the latest football results. Second, conflict. A war is pretty sure to become information, but not another day of peace between Canada and the USA. Third, quantity. Numbers and statistics are often central to reports. A rise in the average temperature, for instance. Fourth, local relevance. Luhmann explains a dog biting a postman may make it into the local paper, but to become national news, it has to be a whole pack of dogs tearing the postman into pieces. Fifth, norm violations. The reality of the mass media was written three decades ago. But Luhmann already mentions political correctness to describe the kind of scandals that attract the media. I have no doubt that he would regard today's cancel culture as an effect of the systemic selectors of the media. Cancel culture results from the media's thirst for norm violations in combination with the following three selectors. Sixth, moral judgment. Luhmann sees moral communication as a symptom of social pathologies. I'll get back to this topic later and maybe make another video on it. But for now, let's just say that the media love to transform facts into information by spicing up norm violations with moral language. In this way, they provoke outrage and intensify polarizations. 
Then there is seventh, ascription to agents. Media moralization relies on personalization. News report not just what is morally scandalous, they illustrate it by singling out the bad guys. That's much more attractive for viewers than taking the trouble to outline complex problems. When problems become news, they are typically ascribed to exemplary agents. Eighth, strong opinions. News and reporting do not just zoom in on norm violations by expressing moral outrage and singling out perpetrators. Especially on social media today, they also suggest strong opinions, inviting instant feedback. In this way, the media resonate with their audiences and, as Luhmann says, adapt to the changes in public opinion that they produced in the first place. The two final selectors listed by Luhmann are cases and routines. On the one hand, information singles out special cases, Fälle, such as accidents, Unfälle, or new findings or inventions, Einfälle. Routines are used by news and reports to fit information into pre-existing categories. Think of sports, movie reviews, or gossip about celebrities, for instance. News cannot but condense, generalize, and schematize information. And they do this by means of their selectors. To abolish selectors, or to only use correct ones, is impossible. Without selectors, there would be no news. And if you would replace selectors, like moral judgments or ascription to agents with others, the news wouldn't be more correct. They would just be less spicy. In short, news tells stories, not the truth. The official newspaper of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was called Pravda, the truth. The claim in today's mainstream media to combat fake news reminds me of that title. It creates the counterfactual illusion that the elimination of fake news will result in simply the truth. The very notion of fake news is a media story. The media make fake news known to be known, but they can never tell us the whole truth about fake news. News are often followed by commercials. Luhmann says, after truth comes advertising. The news have no problem with the fact that, for instance, their stories that inform us about the scandal of fake news are framed by advertising. Next to news, we regard commercials as a perfectly legitimate media program sector. Commercials are everywhere in the media, and we know that we indirectly pay for them because their costs are added to the prices of the products they make us buy. This makes Luhmann wonder. How can well-to-do members of society be so stupid to spend so much money on advertising only to confirm their belief in the stupidity of others? We're perfectly okay with paying companies for manipulating us to buy their stuff. But not only are we that stupid, the cleverer we are, we tend to wrongly convince ourselves that the advertising we pay for only really fools those that are more stupid than we. Given this quite paradoxical social and psychological mechanism, Luhmann calls media advertising the self-organization of folly. But in Luhmann's analysis, advertising is not just self-organizing folly. It's also the Jesus Christ of the media. It sacrifices itself to purify the other program sectors. Luhmann writes, Advertising takes the deadly sin of the mass media upon itself, as if thereby all other programs were saved. The ad next to the news makes the news more credible, simply by emphasizing that it's different from the news. Advertising has another almost religious feature. 
According to Luhmann, it resembles ancient divination practices. It only shows you the surface of things, but mystically promises depth. You see a video of a car passing by in a short moment. And yet, this brief image suggests that if you buy the car, it's going to give you lasting power and sex appeal. By means of this suggestive power, commercials fulfill a much-needed function in today's society. Luhmann says, advertising supplies people who lack taste with taste. Media advertising and fashion are closely tied to one another. We rely on advertising for crucial information, not just on what to buy, but also on which of our clothes we better throw away now. By ironically playing with his own jargon, Luhmann points out another useful function of advertising. Advertising stabilizes the relation between redundancy and variety in everyday culture. There's quite a variety of brands in each shopping mall, all known to be known by advertising. However, when you go to a different shopping mall, it's still the same variety. The variety is also redundant. Advertising establishes this wonderful balance between variety and redundancy that enables people to easily orient themselves in any shopping mall on the globe. The third program sector is entertainment. Entertainment works, according to Luhmann, like a game. It constructs an imagined reality, a second reality, that is distinct from real reality. Luhmann mainly thinks about novels and movies. But we can also think of video games today as a more recent example. Novels and movies and video games also construct information, albeit fictional information. Once more, Luhmann looks back to the times between the 16th and 18th century to explain the function of entertainment. Before modernity, people built their sense of self by identifying with certain characteristics they were born with, such as their class, gender, or place of birth. Luhmann calls this descent or Herkunft. When society became more complex, however, he says, individuals could no longer derive their identity from their descent. Clues for who one is, or would like to be, were increasingly provided by the emerging media, especially novels. These new media, Luhmann writes, invite people to try out virtual realities they encounter in the media. People began to identify, or not identify, with protagonists in literature. To make things a bit more complicated, Luhmann suggests that when reading novels or watching movies, people become accustomed to second-order observation. He says, you learn to observe observers. This is to say how people react in situations, how they observe themselves. By observing in the media how others observe, readers or viewers can draw conclusions about themselves. They can relate themselves creatively to fictional characters. Luhmann says, what is offered in entertainment does not commit anyone to anything particular, but it provides clues for personal identity work. Like modern society in general, this new type of identity is highly dynamic. Luhmann says, you can choose yourself and aren't even obliged to stick with your choice when things get serious. What Luhmann describes here is close to what I call profilicity, an identity technology consisting in the creation of profiles. In novels and movies, we see in a fictional game-like setting how different profiles emerge in feedback loops with their audiences. You can observe these profiles and relate them to yourself, try them out to see how they work, and then develop your own identity in a similar way. The three program sectors, entertainment, advertising, and news, can easily be distinguished. It doesn't take long to know if you're watching news, a commercial, or a movie. But, as Luhmann calls it, mutual borrowing in the form of crossovers between the sectors is common. Arguably, such borrowing has only increased in the past three decades. News have become more entertaining, and movies more like commercials. Think of Barbie, for instance. 
The different program sectors enter into different structural couplings with other systems. Among the most obvious of these are those between politics and news and between the economy and advertisement. This illustrates a core point of Luhmann's theory. No system is in one-sided control of another. The success of politicians depends on how the media report on them. But the media also depend on politics to provide them with narratives and content. The economy depends on media advertising to sell goods. But media advertising also depends on the economy to fill the ad space. Luhmann calls this mutual control a cybernetic cycle. He illustrates it with the example of a thermostat. You can say that by means of the thermostat, the heating system controls the room temperature. Or that the room temperature controls the heating system. Here are a few short conclusions. Newman's basic question about the mass media is, what kind of society emerges if it constantly and continuously informs itself about itself in this way? His basic answer to this basic question is, perhaps the most important result of these analyses is that the mass media generate reality, but a reality that is not subject to consensus. Conclusion one is, the mass media supply society with a background reality that it doesn't agree on. This contested reality affects all of society in a particular way. Luhmann says that the continuous flow of information in the mass media sets up a horizon of self-generated uncertainty. This uncertainty has to do with the code of the mass media, which transforms information into non-information, and thereby generates the constant need for new information. And given the nature of the selectors used by the media to produce information, society seems always on the edge. Conclusion two is, the mass media makes society restless and tense. The restless tension of modern society is very much a moral tension. With an overpowering insistence, the mass media constantly renew morality. Today, Luhmann says, morality needs the mass media, and especially TV. This is not without dangers, Luhmann warns. Morality isn't needed in normal interactions. It's always a symptom of the occurrence of pathologies. Conclusion three is, their preference for moral communication can make the mass media a catalyst of conflict. Like all other contemporary function systems, the mass media operate with second-order observation. In earlier societies, there had already been information on reality based on second-order observation like the knowledge about Atlantis in ancient Greece that Luhmann mentions right at the beginning of his book. However, the mass media are very different from earlier second-order providers of knowledge, such as wise men or priests, who enjoyed some sort of privileged status. Conclusion four is, the mass media make second-order observation the common mode in which reality is constructed and identity is shaped. A difference between Luhmann and earlier philosophers of modernity, from Descartes to Kant and Habermas, is modern thinkers emphasized a first-person perspective. This grounds a modern trust in subjects and their autonomy and sovereign individuality that can see and understand and shape the world. But in today's society, where the mass media have such a strong presence, Whatever we see, we see as being seen by someone. This brings about a shift in perspective. A shift towards seeing not simply what's there, but seeing what's shown to be seen. And this brings about a shift in how we see and show ourselves as well. In the 21st century, in the age of mass and social media, we need to see and show ourselves as being seen. This is to say in today's media, we've entered the age of profilicity. And this is what I'm going to discuss in the next episode of this series on media theory.